thanks for your patience, but we got a few things taken care of. This is Rafi Cohen. He's the editor, or I'm sorry, he's the author of the arena. Inside the tailgating, ticket scalping, mascot racing, dubiously funded, and possibly haunted monuments of American sport. Um, the book was I can showcase it, I guess. The book was the 2018 semifinalist for the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. Um, and previously, Rocky's also served as the deputy editor at the New York Observer. Um, and then <coughs> where he wrote a, a variety of long-form feature and cover stories, including a bombshell profile of Carmelo Anthony in October 2013. He's worked for the likes of uh, GQ, Men's Journal, Slate, The Washington Post, Town & Country, The Wall Street Journal, and Rolling Stone. And so, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Rafi. Thank Thanks guys. a lot. Thank you guys all very much. Um, you know, I'm going to go through here a sort of a presentation I put together about the book, about my experiences with stadiums. Um, I've spent some time talking before this with, uh, with Cody um, and talking a little bit about you know some of the you know some of the ways that you know he likes to try and inspire his students to think about stadiums and or think about sports in general, uh, what these spaces mean, uh, what you know how we can be critical observers, different ways to sort you know to interpret and look at these spaces. And that's largely what I did throughout you know the course of my time. So I just want to sort of provide that as I just want to see that at the beginning here as a lens through which to, to think about what I'm what I'm gonna present. Uh, and then hopefully we can have you know some QA or conversation afterwards and whatever whatever direction that takes us, you know, um, we'll let it. Uh, but before we begin, despite, you know, even though that was a tremendous uh, um, introduction that I in no way helped write um, from Cody, I, the only way that I can really begin a presentation is, especially for one about stadiums, is with a more proper introduction. So here, I'm going to allow Dave Diamante, the former uh, arena announcer for the Brooklyn Nets, to do the honors. From South Orange, New Jersey, a poor middle school group met ball. Yeah. And now, the author of the arena inside tailgating, tip helping, mascot rating, dubiously full, and possibly haunt monuments of American sport. He's a gentleman of the year, a rock, eating a man. Said he was the, the original arena announcer for the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he did me an honor of doing, uh, giving me an, an NBA arena style introduction. So naturally, I find every opportunity I can to play it in public. Uh, and this was just yet another excuse. Um, so I want to start uh, talking first about bathrooms. Uh, and I don't know why, but one of the first things that anyone asks me, almost everyone asks me, when they find out that I wrote a book about stadiums, is that. They want to know which stadiums have the best bathrooms, which is pretty much all the new ones, and which stadiums have the worst bathrooms, which is pretty much all the old ones. And to be honest, I actually have a lot to say about bathrooms. In fact, this was probably the number one lesson I learned from a year of visiting sports stadiums. Pee every chance you get. In fact, Cody spent the morning with me. He can attest to uh, you know, the number of pissed stops you made along the way today. Um, and if you learn nothing else from this talk or from my book, uh, I hope it can be that. Uh, you'll thank me at some point, I promise. Uh, it's not just about biological needs, though. For some fans, bathrooms are about tradition. Seriously. Over the last few years at Wrigley Field, for example, where they've been renovating the historic ballpark where the Chicago Cubs play, uh, they're, they've been updating almost everything, from the concession stands, the bullpens, the clubhouses, you name it. But there's one thing that the fans have insisted that they do not touch, and that is the men's room urinal trucks. Why? Because for many Cubs fans, as I learned, peeing in a truck at Wrigley Field is basically as important to the game day experience as singing the outfield ivy, or singing take me out to the ball game during the seventh inning stretch. For them, 
It's a ritual and a rite of passage. My dad took me to Pia Wrigley Field, and by God, I want to take my son to Pia Wrigley Field. <laughs> I'm not making this up. The Cubs marketing team has frequently heard feedback from fans about this, this heirloom toilet culture. I also experienced it firsthand. At one of my first games at Wrigley Field, this was in the summer of 2015, I was sitting in the upper deck just schmoozing with a couple of fans and who happened to be sitting next to me, and I, the topic of urinal troughs came up. Uh, did the fans really care about the troughs, I wanted to know? Now, this is a real quote from a real person, a middle-aged mortgage broker, in fact. He said, if I'm going to come to Wrigley, I want to piss in a trough. And when he found out that I had yet to piss in a trough, he then and there dragged me to the restroom so we could pee in a trough together. <laughs> okay, now that we've gotten bathrooms out of the way, we can move on to stadiums, because I wrote a book about stadiums. So why stadiums? Why should we care about stadiums? Let me get personal for one second. Whenever I think about going to a ball game, I always picture old Yankee Stadium. Even though it's been destroyed for almost a decade now, I can still close my eyes and picture those dark and dingy concourses. I can still smell the peppers and onions, the hot dogs, the spilt beer. I can feel the stickiness under my feet. And I'll never forget that first flash of green when you walk out into the seating bowl, out from the concourse, and pow, you see the field opening up in front of you. But stadiums aren't just for sports fans. They're monuments to civic pride. They're where we come for unscripted theater, where we come together as communities. And often, for some of us at least, they start to feel like homes away from home. Quick story, in State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State plays, there's a guy who parks his car in the same spot of animal pasture land every week. The school converts these fields into parking lots on football Saturdays because it's a rural school. They wouldn't otherwise have enough space to park the 35,000 or so cars that show up for football games. Now keep in mind, this guy's parking spot is not a reserved spot, but every week he brings a lawnmower to the game and he mows the grass around his spot because it is his spot, it's his home. And yet, for all of our emotional and financial investment in these buildings, and for as much time as we spend dissecting the games therein, what do we really know about our country's secular cathedrals, about our stadiums? In my opinion, the answer to that question, at least as of the start of 2015, was not enough. And so for the next 12 plus months, I set out on a year-long road trip, trying to spend as much time in as many sports venues as possible. So what did I learn, aside from the wisdom of emptying my bladder? Uh, first of all, I learned almost nothing about the games themselves, about sports. As I put it in the introduction, this wasn't meant to be a book about sports, but a book around sports. And over the course of my research, I visited dozens of stadiums and attended scores of games, but I did not see a lot of on-field action. Instead. I spent my time in the service tunnels, parking lots, production booths, groundskeeper clubhouses, and cramped mascot rooms. You see, on game days, these steel and concrete structures come alive. They transform into small cities with coordination from police and fire departments, with traffic plans and choreographed crowd control, with jail cells and hospital, hospital beds when things turn ugly. And with an unseen legion of operational staffers, denizens of a stadium underworld, whose efforts, as busy and intricate as those of an ant colony, make the place run. These faceless functionaries take our tickets, sweep up our peanut shells, break up our fights, cook our hot dogs, and do just about everything else we simply take for granted. So I wanted to look under the hood of these venues to see what's below the surface. I wanted to explore the logistical underpinnings and to profile the people and the systems 
that make these places tick. So here's a little taste of what I saw. It's a video and hopefully it's not as uh, syncopated as the last one. looking under the hood of these venues, how was I going to do that? The answer, just say yes. That was my mantra for a year. Those three words, as I traveled across the country by myself, sometimes staying with friends, sometimes with family, often with strangers, but always going to the games alone. Just say yes. Because when it came to my reporting, I wanted to experience as much as possible. And frequently, that meant doing things outside of my comfort zone, like embedding with the Raiders' infamous black hole fan section in Oakland, or interviewing so many stadium-adjacent scalpers and hustlers that I eventually had a knife pulled on me in Cleveland, or taking a ride on the official Olympic bobsled track in Park City, Utah, which may sound fun, but was legitimately terrifying. The point is, I wanted to open myself up, to talk to everyone, to do everything. And as a result, I did learn all kinds of things, like ticket scalping is a dying trade. So at first, none of the scalpers wanted anything to do with me. And honestly, I don't blame them. I mean, what would you do if you're a scalper and some stranger with a notepad comes up and starts asking questions? They probably thought I was an art. They just walked away. Eventually, though, I broke through. In Cleveland, where I spent two weeks hanging out in the Gateway District, which is home to Progressive Field and Quicken Loans Arena, it was with a scalper named Big Mike. Big Mike took me under his wing. He gave me credibility with the rest of the scalpers, and eventually, they got used to me hanging around. Meanwhile, in Boston, where I spent a week around Fenway, it was with a 30-year scalping vet named Jimmy Downs. The key to scalping, Jimmy told me, is quote, grinding. In other words, doing volume. Just buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. Never falling in love with a single seat or holding on to a ticket for too long. You see, some hustlers might hold a ticket all day, because, but then they can get stuck with it. And they get stuck with it because they think it's worth a certain amount. But if nobody wants to pay that amount, then that's not what it's worth. As Jimmy put it, explaining his response to people when they tell him what a ticket should be worth, an ice cream has no bones, so what? 
Unfortunately, these guys aren't making the money that they used to. Some of the decline can be traced to the loosening of scalping laws, uh, which has happened on a local level, and that's introduced new competition to the biz. Uh, previously, half-hearted scalpers you know, would stay away for fear of arrest, fines, or, or abuse from police, like taking a walkie-talkie to the face, which happened to Jimmy. But a large part of it is also the result of new technology, and even not so new technology, like the internet. Think about it. Secondary markets have been overwhelmed by websites like StubHub and SeatGeek. In fact, it's estimated that 60 to 70% of the secondary ticket market in America existed outside of venues as recently as 2010. By 2015, that number was down to 15 or 20%. Imagine where it is now. On top of that, a lot of teams are shifting to digital ticket environments in which there are no physical tickets. Now, I know a lot of people probably won't mourn the loss of ticket scalpers, but I will. I don't think of them as parasites preying on the passions of the fan. I save that distinction for many of the team owners who accept hundreds of millions of dollars in public subsidies. Instead, I think scalpers represent an organic element of stadium-based ecosystems, like barnacles living on the side of a ship. And on a personal level, I worry about these guys in particular who've been selling tickets all their lives and don't necessarily have resumes or references or any other way to make a living. And I wonder, what will they do next? So what else did I learn? I learned that the best grass is grown on plastic. This was from my chapter on groundskeeping. And after spending some time with the Braves in Atlanta, I drove several hundred miles south to Alabama to the Redneck Riviera. That's where I toured my first sidebar. So this was actually something I didn't even know going into this experience, this project. And I guess I just never really thought about it, that major league teams and even college teams don't grow their own grass. They buy it from sod farms, like Bent Oak, which is the farm I visited, or rather was taken to, because they don't give out their address. And part of the reason they try to stay off the radar, besides protecting a range of proprietary machinery, which they wouldn't let me photograph or even describe, is uh, that they grow grass for competing institutions, like the University of Alabama and Auburn University. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with SEC football, and I don't need to tell you how rabid that rivalry can be. And you can imagine what an Auburn fan might do if he knew where the field was being grown for Alabama, or vice versa. But it was actually really cool seeing all these fields lying next to each other. The fields for Auburn, Alabama, the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Miami Dolphins, the University of Georgia, and more. It was like visiting a baby nursery. Just fields, actual pro and college level fields, as far as the eye can see. And even though these fields are going to grow up and become bitter rivals, for now they're just siblings, peacefully coexisting. And they're not just any old fields, because it's not just any old grass. This grass is literally grown on plastic. So what happens is they first grow the grass in the earth, the regular way for about nine months at a farm in Georgia. Then they harvest it, and they ship it down to Ben Oak, where it's laid on plastic. Picture a big black garbage bag or tarp, as you can kind of see here. Uh, and for the next year, the grass is treated with a care program that is customized to its destination stadium and fattened up by raking in sand. Why is this better? For one, it's sand-based, not dirt-based. And therefore, the sod is less likely to come apart in the rain, because as I was told, quote, there's no mud in it. Beyond that, the turf is extremely dense and strong. Because when the, when the roots grow down, they hit the plastic, and then they turn back up, and it starts growing within itself. So when they ship the sod, they're not actually hurting it, because it's not connected to the earth anymore. As one of Ben Oak staffers put it to me, other guys that sell grass, they harvest it. They cut it off dirt, and they're cutting off half the plant. At Ben Oak, they just cut it into strips, 42 inches wide and between 45 and 55 feet long. 
Each one weighs about 2,000 pounds. They roll it up and they ship it out. And it doesn't hurt the grass at all. They're basically just moving it. And a team can play on it the very next day. It's so heavy and so durable, it won't slide around, not even beneath the feet of a 300 pound lineman. In fact, the owner of the sod farm doesn't even call it grass. In his words, it's carpet, dude. So another thing I learned is that halftime shows are way more nerve wracking than they look on TV. So for a chapter on fan entertainment, I ended up spending a lot of time with an NBA halftime performer named The Amazing Slatic, who actually has some Memphis ties, which we can talk about. His real name is Gary Borstelman, uh, but The Amazing Borstelman just didn't have the same ring to it. Uh, anyway, Slatic has a fascinating backstory. He spent more than 30 years in the circus, this is him, as an acrobat and daredevil, before he ever got a chance to perform on center court in an NBA arena. And along the way, he's, he has had some close brushes with death and serious injury. This business is not for the faint of heart. His first close call was when he was young, still an aspiring stuntman. He and his friend were meant to be shot out of a cannon for a human cannonball stunt. And Slatic was supposed to go first, but he chickened out. He was too scared. He didn't like the idea of a stunt that was out of his control. So his friend went first, and his friend missed the net by 15 feet. He came out of the hospital in a full body cast. Meanwhile, in the circus, he had friends who've been mauled by tigers and crushed to death by elephants. But the one incident that cut closest to home was in the lead up to the 1997 Super Bowl in New Orleans. He was part of an acrobat team that was going to bungee jump during the halftime show. His girlfriend was on the team, and so was his girlfriend's sister. And she was actually thinking about getting out of the circus business at that time. This was going to be one of her last stunts. So as part of the stunt, each jumper had a spotter. And they had, the spotter had to keep the bungee cord sturdy. It wasn't actually tied in anywhere. But during the halftime dress rehearsal on the Thursday before the Super Bowl, something went wrong. The guy who was spotting his girlfriend's sister either wasn't paying attention or simply let the rope slip. She fell almost 200 feet straight down to the floor of the Superdome. She didn't survive. It's not just injury and death though. Sladek has had some run-ins with the law. He picked up some bad habits and vices during his early circus years. And on top of all that, he's just had some poor luck along the way, like twice having his van stolen with all of his possessions so to me, his story is really a kind of redemption story, especially with this late in life mainstream success he's finally enjoying. So now, at almost 60 years old, he's one of the biggest halftime shows out there. His act is called the Tower of Chairs. And what he does is he stacks six chairs, one on top of another, more than 20 feet in the air. They don't click together, there are no safety gimmicks. And then he climbs the spindles all the way to the top. And once he's there, he does handstands. It is truly amazing. So, Sladek asked me if I would be his assistant on center court for one of his performances. Of course, I said yes, just say yes. But oh man, did I quickly regret that decision. Honestly, I thought I was going to kill him. First of all, the Tower of Chairs looks a lot sturdier when you're in the stands. When you're right next to it, it wobbles like a street sign in a hurricane. Meanwhile, Sladek is 20 feet in the air, sweating, shifting, recalibrating his weight. And on top of all that, the chairs are so much heavier than they look. And for the last two, because he's so high up already, you have to hand him the chairs on top of this pole. Uh, this like, metal pole contraption that he jerry-rigged together himself. And that is so top-heavy, I was terrified I was going to lose control and plunge the, the pole into his chairs. I was so nervous that I was going to kill him that I actually wasn't getting the pole close enough that he could reach the chairs. <laughs> and so, of course, this is a timed act. He needs to be on and off the court in like six and a half minutes or so. 
And so eventually Sladek started hissing at me. Come on, man, closer, closer. Uh, for, for the full story, you'll have to read the book. But uh, suffice it to say, we both survived, uh, although it was legitimately a little touch and go. Um, okay, so another thing that a lot of people ask me is what were some of the most surprising things? You know, the stuff that happens behind the scenes, the weird logistics, the fun trivia. And I'll tell you, one of the things that really stuck out to me, and maybe some of y'all can appreciate this, was just how hyper-targeted so many stadium-related jobs can be. For example, did you know that at City Field, where the New York Mets play, there's a five-person crew whose only task is to monitor the ballpark's walk-in beer fridges. During sellouts, the team goes through something like 800 kegs of beer. And for the entire game, these, all these guys do is walk around the service tunnel, going from beer fridge to beer fridge, swapping out old kegs for fresh ones. Not a bad game. Meanwhile, at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas, where the Dallas Cowboys play, there is a lone employee in charge of changing every single light bulb inside this three million square foot facility. Literally, the guy's only job is to walk around changing light bulbs. It's a full-time position. Jerry's World has a lot of light bulbs. But my favorite, weirdly specific stadium-related job no longer exists, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately. It was at the now defunct Houston Astrodome. As you may know, the Astrodome was a hugely important building when it first opened in the 1960s. It wasn't just the world's first domed stadium, it was also seen as such a futuristic feat of engineering that the facility quite literally helped rebrand the entire city of Houston almost overnight from being seen as a cow town to a technology leader. And yet, there were issues inside the stadium. Air conditioning gusts could mess with would-be home run balls. The original translucent roof caused such terrible glares for fielders, when they tried to catch pop flies, they would miss it. And perhaps most disturbingly, the stadium soon developed an infestation of giant rats. As a result, the stadium was forced to employ a man to tend to a herd of feral cats, and the cats would combat the rats. So, I didn't take this photo, by the way. I just Googled giant rats. <laughs> um, so, I'd like to talk a little bit now about food. Uh, because of course, food is such an important part of the stadium experience. As the Danish historian, Neil Kaiser Nielsen once wrote, with beer and hot dogs, one confirms one's temporary identity as a stadium person. Let's start with some history. I'm sure some of you know the name Harry M. Stevens. And you also probably know that he's often credit, credited with having invented the hot dog, which may or may not be true. But did you know that before Stevens brought tube steaks to the polo grounds for the first time in 1901, stadium foods often included all kinds of weird and bizarre items. Like what, you wonder? Like hard-boiled eggs and coconut custard pie. Not exactly peanuts and crackers. But in those early days, the fact is, you never really knew what you would get as far as refreshments went at a sporting event. At a 1908 regatta in Poughkeepsie, New York, for instance, there was a quote, fat man in a pink shirt mixing lemonade in a wash tub. That's not him. Uh, as the sporting scholar Alan Gutman reports in one of his books. Meanwhile, at horse racing events in the mid 1800s, it wasn't uncommon for people to open up their homes as concession stands. Another early innovation, maybe not as big as a hot dog, but close, came at Wrigley Field, when it was still known as Wheatman Park. That's where Charles Wheatman first set up concession stalls behind the seating hole, because fans were annoyed by the vendors who would walk the aisles and block their views. Maybe the fans would have been less annoyed if the vendors were more like those that existed in the time of the Roman Colosseum when, as the Smithsonian Magazine put it, handsome stewards pass through the crowd, 
carrying trays of cakes, pastries, dates, and other sweetmeats in generous cups of wine. So I know many of you either are studying or teaching hospitality in one form or another. Uh, so I don't need to tell you all that concessions or hospitality isn't an easy business. And so over the course of my research, I really came to appreciate the many, many different kinds of challenges that have existed over the years. Like in 1926, when Pittsburgh's Forbes Field suffered a hot dog panic when the food product ran out during a rain delay. According to an article that ran at the time, the stadium's refreshments manager learned from the ordeal and took, quote, such precautions that there can never be another hot dog scandal in his park. In more recent times, as stadiums have welcomed outside food partners who insist that those stadiums uphold their brand-specific standards, hot dogs have presented a different kind of challenge. Take Nathan's, for example. So the hot dog company has rigid policies regarding its signature product. Specifically, specifically, the slight curvature of the meat needs to be face up, or excuse me, face down when cooking, and face up when served. There is even a handy reminder phrase for proper Nathan's hot dog presentation. Frowns on the grill, smiles on the butt. And then there are the fans, and fans can be a handful. They will always whine about prices, but that's just the beginning. In fact, I don't think there's anything fans won't complain about. Like during Prohibition, when Philly fans would chant, we want beer, during ball games. Of course, they could have just taken matters into their own hands, like the fans did at Monarchs games in Kansas City, where they would sell liquor underneath the seats. So what else will fans complain about? My train was delayed. The guy next to me spilled his beer. A pigeon shit on me. But all of those are pretty mundane in the grand scheme of things. The most memorable customer complaint I heard came from City Field, where I spent most of my time for my chapter on logistics and concessions. As the story goes, a hot dog vendor was passing some mustard packets to a fan, and he warned him that the packets can be tough to open the fan may want to use his teeth, the vendor said. Well, this apparently was very offensive to the fan. Why? Because as it turned out, the man had no teeth. I'll tell you one other thing about hot dogs. Don't throw them. The Kansas City Royals mascot, Slugger, learned this the hard way in 2009 when he tossed a foil-wrapped hot dog into the stands and the flying wiener detached the man's retina. Now you would think that other mascots would have learned from this incident, but apparently not. Just this year, the Philly fanatic injured a fan when he launched a hot dog into the stands and it hit a woman in the face. She received a CT scan to make sure the hot dog didn't give her a concussion. It didn't. But if you think fans are bad, let me tell you about the vendors. There has long been a game of cat and mouse between concessionaires and vendors, with the vendors running scams and managers trying to catch them. Really, vendors have always figured ways to game the system, even since the very early days. That's when they would water down drinks or bring back refilled lemon soda bottles as returns because the liquid was basically clear or steal a peanut or two from individual brown bags and create additional units which they would sell and keep the profits from. Well, as a result, at, over the years, concessionaires have fought back, like investing in volume control devices, and by keeping a detailed account of all inventory, including paper cups. That, by the way, is why a stadium charges full price for an empty cup. But it's not just the fans who get charged. When the LA Lakers ran out of cups one time at a home game and they needed to take some from a nearby concession stand, the team's GM didn't get a discount. He had to pay full price. But, and you know what? Scheming employees can still be a problem today. To combat theft at City Field, the team does bag checks at the end of each game. 
We're busting people constantly, as one stadium worker told me. And occasionally they find someone with hundreds of bills stuffed down their pants. More often, it's just a few bucks. But the truth is, you never know what you're going to find, according to Paul Schwartz, who is the executive director of venue services at City. He told me, quote, one day we opened an employee's bag and there was the head of a pig in there. But it wasn't stolen, he clarified, just memorable. As he put it, somebody came in with a pig head and left with a pig head. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the concession section. As we move on, I want to talk a little bit about another question that I thought about constantly over the course of my reporting, and then while I was writing the book as well. And that question is, what do we want from our stadiums? So there are a lot of ways we can dissect this. One way would be to look at all the various stadium trends across the country. So for example, advancing technology is a major trend. As fans, we want fast and reliable Wi-Fi networks so that we can upload photos to social media or check our emails or use venue-specific apps, which are a growing trend and unto themselves. But you can't stop there. Teams and venues are continuing to upgrade those second screen experiences with multiple viewing angles and on-demand and real-time interactivity. And that functionality, the interactivity, is setting the stage for pop-up gaming outlets. And eventually, as state laws begin to change, real-time gambling. Beyond that, venues are installing connected devices and technology in order to create, quote, smart stadium experiences. They are exploring virtual reality and augmented reality, and they are investing in broadcast equipment so they can cut their own feed, their own shows, which are beamed to ever larger video boards and jumbotrons, like the new Halo board in Atlanta. We might also not be so far away from 3D or holographic replays, which is kind of crazy. Another major trend right now is this idea of segmented experiences, or neighborhoods within a stadium. We're still going for a communal experience. Stadiums are one of the last places we go to be with other people, to experience a live event. But at the same time, it's much more splintered than it ever was. You go to a game now, and you have the kid zone out in the outfield, and you have the luxury club behind home plate, and there are some other suites in another area, and a craft beer place over here, and a standing room only bar in the other section of the outfield for the young professionals. It's all about trying to hit these very targeted markets, making sure that there's something for everyone, a quote, product mix. One thing I wonder is if that's what we want, or if that's what we're told that we want from our stadiums. And I'm sure it's a mix of both. The truth is, stadiums are becoming increasingly corporate spaces. They are better places to sell us things, but that doesn't mean that they are better places to actually watch sports. And this isn't necessarily a completely modern trend. In a 1974 letter to the editor in Sports Illustrated, a fan named Frank Faulkner wrote to complain about, quote, new stadiums. In his words, it seems they were built for everyone but the fans. An interesting experiment to me would be if a team were willing to go completely in the opposite direction. See what happens. There's a British sociologist uh, named John Williams, and he wrote more than 20 years ago already that stadiums were becoming disnified. There are nice bathrooms and more comfortable seats and high-end restaurants, and it's meant to be, as much as possible, an easy and painless experience. But why do we want that from our stadiums? Why do we demand all these creature comforts and gourmet hot dog stands? Williams makes a comparison to people who go hunting. We would never expect these sorts of things if we were going into the woods. If I'm going hunting, I don't expect a nice toilet around every bluff or a craft beer bar. I'm going to get dirty. I'm going to be uncomfortable. And that's part of the experience. I mean, of course, no stadium would ever do this because there's money to be made. But 
But what I'm suggesting is, so what? Just one team, just one team. Why can't we strip it, strip it back and just have the most elemental aspects of the stadium experience? The playing field, the metal bleachers, and that's it. It's going to be uncomfortable, yes, but you're going to watch the damn game and you'll be in it with everyone else. Not ordering twice fried nachos from the tequila bar or uploading a photo to Instagram. I'd love for just one stadium to let us go hunting again. Just one. But all of those, those are the market force trends. Perhaps a more elemental way to consider the question of what we want from stadiums would be to ask, why do we go to games? And while here, we open a Pandora's box because we go for any number of reasons. We go to enact legacy to enable our traditions. We go to be with the same people we tailgated with for the last 20 years. We go to sit in the same seats our grandfather sat in, to pee in the same urinal troughs. We go to gawk at the new towering, tech-rich monstrosities of new stadiums. We go to sing fight songs, to shotgun beers and group rituals, and do push-ups if we let any of our, build, our beer spill, or at least what's the, that's what they do around Michigan Stadium. But even if it's not a beer-chugging circle specifically, Many of us do go to cut loose, to have an outlet, to forget ourselves, to act like a fool, wear cheese on our heads, receive permission to scream. There's a college football uh, marketing and game day experience expert named Guido Delia. And as he put it to me, it is about enabling sanctioned stupidity. <laughs> In terms of using the video board specifically, he explained how he uses it as a conductor for the crowd. It is not a TV show, he says. It is to help incite a riot. The goal is to get the crowd feeling powerful, to become a mob. And I get what he's saying completely. Now, this is highly unscientific, but in my opinion, the best stadium experiences are the ones that can somehow transport you. That could be at Fenway or Wrigley or Lambeau when you feel like you are time traveling into history. Or maybe at a place like AT&T Stadium where they go to such great lengths to entertain you. Or maybe it's just the vibe of the fans themselves, like Guido is talking about. But we go to be a part of something. We go to forget ourselves. We go to remember who we once were. We go to be moved. Wherever we go, though, these really are important buildings. So we're nearing the end of this presentation here, but before we wrap up, I just want to talk for a second about American stadiums in general. Because traveling all over the country, visiting these venues, I think really gave me a unique lens through which to view our country. In many ways, stadiums really have become our signature civic building like grand cathedrals, ornate train stations, and skyscrapers before them. They're the venues in which we are making some of, some of our most serious societal investments, not just financially, but also culturally, politically, and emotionally. And more than that, they are reflections of who we are as a people, as a nation. They are where we come together. They are how we come together. And in these arenas, we express our values. They are symbols of what's important to us, of who we are and what we care about, both for better and for worse. But the fact is, if you go to a stadium for a football Sunday or a baseball doubleheader in, in the middle of the summer or even a, a December NBA game, you're going to see more than a live athletic contest. You're going to witness a small slice of America. Thank you. So that's... Thank you. I and mean, that's sort of, you know, an encapsulation of, of, you know, what I experienced and kind of some of the, you know, brief highlights of, uh, of, of a year, more than a year, really, on the road. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really opened up for me was the different ways to look at these places. It was something that I was always interested in. Uh, you know, even from like a journalistic perspective, one of the things that I've always tried to do is just take a different tack. Uh, 
maybe some of you are familiar with a journalist by the name of Jimmy Breslin. Uh, he's the one who wrote the famous JFK grave digger story, which perhaps you've heard of. It's, if you've ever taken a journalism class, they probably told you about it. And basically the idea was, on the morning that JFK was being buried, everybody was flocking around, the family of him was trying to get a quote, and he was like, I don't want to write the same story that everyone else is going to write. So we saw the guy who dug JFK's grave, standing by himself over off the side, and he went and interviewed him, and he told the story through his eyes. And for me, stadiums, you know, I always noticed these things. I always, I always noticed the vendors. I always noticed, you know, the, uh, the mascots, the grounds crew. But I never really knew about it. I never really knew what made these places tick. And, you know, maybe some people have written about it, but not in a way that I felt like was satisfactory for me. And so this was that opportunity. And it's amazing the way that it's, it's changed the way I think about and look at everything um, when I go to a game. I, I was talking to Cody about this a couple weeks ago, but so the first time I went to a game after after this experience was maybe six months after my last reporting trip, uh, and I went to back to Yankee Stadium, which which by the way is not one of my favorite stadiums, even though I'm a Yankee fan. And it was amazing to me how like yes, I was there and I watched the game, but I almost started to like see the Matrix. I felt like I was Keanu Reeves and. Like I would see the ones and zeros, and I could see how everything was connected. When I got off the subway, like I, I could see the snaking, you know, crowd control line to get us through the door, which, by the way, needed work. Um, and I knew like where the PVC pipes were, like bringing, you know, the keg beer to the concession stalls. And I knew that when someone got into a fight, which happened that night, the like the rotation that was going to happen of the staffers to take care of that and where that person was going to be brought to. And to me, that suddenly the game was no longer just the game. It was part of this much grander orchestration, this ballet that was happening. And it was just one part of it. Uh, and that's kind of, for me, what happened through every aspect of this. Every chapter was like a different way to break down the stadium experience. Um, I, I would love to open it up if, if anyone has any questions or else we can, you know, I would, I would love to also, uh, you know, maybe maybe turn you know turn some of the question to you and think about what are some of the ways that you've either you know thought about stadiums differently or maybe would think about them differently than like a typical sports fan. So, uh, I'll ask. I have some questions on your uh, dubiously funded uh, point up there on the screen. Yes. Public money when it comes to building arenas and stadiums. Yes, dubiously funded. Um, so, I mean, as we all probably know, there, you know, there's been a trend in the United States over the last 50, 60, some 60, 70 years uh, towards public money um, going into stadiums. And there has been a sort of parallel trends at different points over the decades to the ways that those, you know, that the leases were structured. And slowly over time, power dynamic has shifted away from cities and toward um, and toward the teams themselves. Sweetheart leases started becoming a thing in the 1980s when, whereas cities used to be able to recoup their um, front end costs by, by things like gate receipts and parking and suite revenue, suddenly that started going to the, um, you know, to the teams. So to answer your question, uh, or to, to comment on it, I, it's, it we, we've heard we've heard over the last 25, 30 years about how stadiums are, are an investment activity. Stadiums can be a boon for local economies. My comment would be that that's not true, and pretty much all economic evidence points to the fact that that is not the case. Um, there is no measurable economic benefit for you know to building a stadium in almost every case. In fact, the majority of the time. It's an economic negative, um, and that being said, that doesn't mean that there's not value to building a stadium. Things to consider like civic pride, things to consider like quality of life. But what that means is that cities and municipalities, when they're thinking about building stadiums and making major, major investments that could come at the expense of things like roads and schools and hospitals, 
need to think about it not as an investment activity, but as a consumption activity. Is this something we want to spend our money on? Not is this going to make us rich, because it's not. But in the same way that you build a golf course or an opera house, think about it that way. Is this what's important to our community? Is this how we want to spend our money? And have an honest conversation about that within the community. If you're, start, if you're hearing people, you know, stadium advocates, which are you know, mostly going to be a coalition of team owners and construction, you know, people in the construction business who will directly benefit from, uh, from the stadium, telling you that it's going to make you rich, that's when you stop listening. But it doesn't mean that's not a thing to do. Unfortunately, as long as team owners and leagues have a monopoly over the number of teams, they control all of the supply with seemingly infinite demand among US cities, they're going to be able to, for lack of a better word, extort public subsidies. But it's up to the individual cities to decide what it's worth to them and to not go in blind thinking that they're gonna make their money back, because they're not, and that's why it's dubiously funded. Yeah. I don't, <clears throat> I don't wanna put Dr. Hutchinson on the spot, but we do have someone who studies escalate, escalation of commitment, and uh, in particular, de-escalation of commitment. And so it, re it reminded me when you were talking about would one stadium just kind of go back um, to the way that it was, do you see anything like that happening? So in other words, like this morning we talked about like some of the modular stadiums and everything yeah. like that, but do right. you see a professional team or a big time college athletics program actually kind of moving away from the mega super suites right. and things like that and going back to what like Lambo used to be? Yeah. Um, I definitely don't see anyone going back to it. Uh, but, that, but what is a really good point there is that idea of college stadiums because colleges don't have the same leverage over their locales as professional teams. The University of Michigan can't say, we're going to relocate to North Dakota if you don't build us a $100 million stadium. Uh, so, so colleges are a place where that does still exist, kind of, right? They're, they're, I remember going to a game, a Wisconsin Badgers game, and I couldn't believe how you know, crappy the stands were. Uh, but that was, but and, and like that was probably like close to twenty years ago, and at that point I was like, God, this is you know, where's my cushion and my, you know, you know, and my easy access to the bathroom. But now I'm really grateful, you know, for that to still exist because those are places that we can find that. But it's almost by by accident, you know. It's it's almost. I mean, if those stadium, I mean, if those athletic departments of those stadiums could, you know extort public money and upgrade, they would, because they would get the revenues out of them. As we were discussing earlier today, stadiums are not a money-making activity. The only way you make money from a stadium is if someone else pays for it, if someone else is subsidizing it. There's an economist by the name of Jeffrey Profiter, and the way he put it to me, he explained it to me that I felt was really helpful uh, in terms of thinking about it, was that if you're building a stadium, and putting in you know, a source of revenue is gonna cost you a dollar, and it's gonna spit off 99 cents of revenue, you're not gonna do it. But if you only have to put in 50 cents of that dollar, you're gonna buy a lot of it. Even though, you're, even though ultimately it's a loss because you're getting all the profit. Uh, are you familiar with UCF and what they did in their stadium? This one or the beach? Pardon me? Were they the beach for the swimming pool? No, no. They built, a, they built an on-campus stadium, yeah. but they spent absolutely no money. I mean, you would think with all the money and all the sports facilities they have there, they put in 45,000 seats, all metal benches, very few suites, just cut to the core because A, they didn't have the, the, the space, yeah. and B, they knew they were a college stadium, you know, Orlando, and that was about it. Yeah. So that, that's one example you might look into. They didn't, I mean, that, I don't know what level of public money they have, but probably almost none. Zero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all done by the university. So the only way it's going to happen is through The, the only way they could actually get an on-campus stadium was to build it themselves, like, in this park. Right. Right here on campus. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, stadiums in the first place, where they, you know, they were built originally by the team owners. And that's, 
That's and, and, and it was their it was their it was their dollars on the line. The only way we would get that is when if you have people thinking about it from a purely economic perspective, and economic not just from money, but just in terms of like what just makes sense here, uh, then we'll get back to like uh, maybe we'll get back to like an era of reasonable stadiums. But that's just not where we are, and I don't think that's it. I don't think there's a way to get back there because I don't know how you get how you reduce the public subsidies. I mean, honestly. When I finished writing this book, I was optimistic that we had, we had reached a point where there were, you weren't going to have the mega deals anymore. Because every time it happened, it, was, it, it would blow up in the city space. And then right after that, Las Vegas gave three quarters of a billion dollars to get the Raiders to come. Uh, and it's because they're a desperate town. It's because they're shrinking. Their economy is shrinking. It's a, it's a play of desperation. Uh, it's splashy in the headlines. You know, it's... Be great for a few years, but unless John Gruden, you know, really screws up before they get there. Uh, but it's as long as there's a desperate town and desperate politician, it's going to happen. And we got a lot of towns in the United States, so I think they can keep they can play, keep playing that game of leapfrog. Did you confirm where Jimmy Hoffa is? <laughs> <laughs> Underneath the Meadowlands. I did ask, but they didn't. Uh, I did spend some time there, but they uh, they, they gave me a no comment. They just shake your case, huh? Yeah, they wouldn't let me. I tried. I just asked if I could go out with you know a metal detector and try and find his rings, but no, that that still a mystery. Right. I have a question. That I think we talked about this before too, but uh, do you see any difference in the tailgating traditions across the state? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, right. And, you know, absolutely. And this is, partly goes back to the idea of what I was talking about, that just stadiums in general are such an interesting lens through which to view the country because that community represents itself. You know, it presents itself at these spaces. And so tailgating in Kansas City looks nothing like it looked like in Dallas. In Kansas City, you know, it was all barbecue. Uh, in Dallas, you know, the cow, and, part, and, and it's interesting because I, I wonder how much of it is also a reflection of sort of like the team and how much of it is a reflection of the community because in Dallas, this glitzy, over the top stadium, you know, this sort of like everyone shows up to be seen was reflected in the tailgate. Almost every single tailgate tent along the way had an amateur DJ, like literally like spinning in, out before a Cowboys game. And I was like, why? It's like, because that's what we're doing. Like, that's like, we're here to party. We're here to have fun. We're here to like present ourselves. Uh, in New Orleans, where there's almost no parking, you know, fans still found a way to tailgate. They, they're literally under the highway overpass. They would set up shop and they had, you know, uh, big pots of, of crawfish and other things boiling. And there was one guy on the sidewalk grilling, uh, uh, you know, grilling sausages and Baudin. Baudin uh, and, and, it, and it, was, it was really interesting. In, in, in Oakland, in Oakland uh, you know, in Oakland there was just like so much energy. There was, you felt like, and, and part of that is also a reflection of that fact that the Raiders, the Raiders, the Raiders fans have found a way to create community around this team in a way that goes so far beyond the football game. Um, so I would, I, so yes, there's absolutely, absolutely, you, I don't know that it, 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 it's always going to be an apples to apples comparison that you can say this is a reflection of this part of the city, this is a reflection, or, or excuse me, this part of the country versus another. But I think that's one of the variables, one of the ingredients in terms of what creates each of that, you know, that tailgating uh, culture around each stadium. Uh, and so for that alone, it was really fun. It was really fun to just see how these fans were presenting themselves. Obviously, stadiums are not unique to America, but there's something uniquely American about all U.S. stadiums, and I think part of that is the way they're funded, for one, um, and and 
part of that is, 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 is part of the way that our leagues are structured. I mean, if you think about things in, um, in European soccer, like relegation, like if, if a team is not good or they move out, you just start another team. And like, yeah, you'll start in the bottom rung, but you can work your way back up. They don't have that monopoly system the same way, same way we do here. Uh, so for the most part, stadiums in Europe, um, I mean, speaking just mostly from like an anecdotal and academic perspective, not, not having been on the ground, and I know that there, there have been absolutely some stadiums that are pretty over the top in Europe, um, but the vast majority of them have been pretty slow to catch up in terms of like, you know, the luxury amenities and, and that sort of thing, or at least the vast majority of them stay, you know, stay pretty, pretty low tech in that way. Um, I think I think what's interesting there um, would be mostly right from from like a fan perspective. Uh, so that would be to it would be more like taking us one of my chapters, the the sixth chapter, and then expanding that one into Europe. As opposed to I don't know that the rest of them would necessarily be a, a meaningful difference between like how you cook a hot dog here versus cook a hot dog there. Uh, but it's definitely it's definitely of interest to me, and I think it is most interesting. From that kind of like fan culture, you know, uh, perspective, um, which you know, which has been done, you know, to some extent. I mean, my, my favorite book on the topic is Among the Thugs, which obviously is thirty years old at this point. Um, by Bill Buford, if anyone's familiar with it, and he actually became uh, a soccer hooligan and was deeply embedded in the culture. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, there's certainly a lot there. There's a lot of meat on the bone for sure. I, I can kind of comment a little bit because I've done some stadium research outside the U.S. in Europe, in uh, uh, South America specifically, and I think you're touching on something that's really important. It's a different sport, soccer. The way they handle it is completely different. So, for example, uh, there's virtually no tailgating and there's no concession food service because once they get in those stadiums, they stay in their seat are so locked into the team and their chant that everything else is just well, when the game is over they, they all go home. And it's a continuous game. I mean the clock yeah. you know separate happens. Well and, and also the, the financial economic piece. Right. They don't have as much money as the US citizen does and what they spend in stadiums. I mean you're lucky to get a dollar per person out of I mean most of their concession operations I mean they sell out before the game starts and they close. Because they don't want to be a part of it. The most interesting thing. The other thing is, is there's yeah. a lot of drugs too. That's it. <laughs> they do a lot of marijuana smoking in, in the actual venue. You're not allowed to smoke cigarettes, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you go to the right concert in the U.S., that'll. Work out <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's actually it, it, in, in, in sort of the, the the flip side of the fan perspective is actually the thing that always most interested me about potentially doing any international research was actually a security element. You know how because because of the you know the, the you know the rabidness of soccer fans and they're not even just 1980 hooligans they especially start talking about you know South or Central American uh, soccer or even games uh, you know games in you know the Mexican leagues that how do you how do you sort of police a crowd that is even more affiliated and invested and you know you know what they do. Buy a ticket for a section, okay? And they fence off all the sections. So if you were at the Liberty Bowl, for example, and you were in section 105, first come, first serve in that section, and it fills up. But they have literally chain link fences between each one because it cuts down on the fights. And right. Although they stopped doing that in the, um, England after Hillsborough, because yeah. all the after in Hillsborough there was a there was a, a crowd stampede. crush stampede, stampede and. Uh, with the crowd crush, you know, fans were you know literally lifted off their feet just because the bodies became so close together that in fact you can't breathe. People, you they they die standing up, being suffocated in the crowd crush. So that, and that, the result of that was because they put up the fence, people had nowhere to go.
think it's, I mean, I, in fact, and I, I don't think that's actually antithetical to the idea of it being reflective of American society. We are becoming more corporate as a society, you know, and stadiums are a reflection of that. And the risk is how, how do team owners sort of balance this idea of corporate and consumerism versus community, right? Because there's sort of a natural organic element of community that exists at stadiums from you know, outside the tailgating to inside in the stands. And just to give an example of the Dallas Cowboys, which is like the most corporate, um, fans when they moved over from Texas Stadium into AT&T Stadium, they you know, were asked to pay uh, PSLs, personal seat licenses, you know, as, as expensive as $150,000 per seat. And folks who were sitting together have been sitting there for 30 years together in the lower bowl, you know, 40 yard line, who could afford their, you know, their, their tickets, but couldn't afford, you know, couldn't afford that, have to give them up. And now, when they go back, maybe they'll sit in a seat, um, you know, for a game, for a, you know, once a year or whatever, and you look around and the people who you knew aren't there anymore. You're not there anymore. And so like that starts to fray that community. It starts to fray the relationship. You know, the relationship you have the team is partly the relationship you have with everything else surrounding the team. And so I think that there's a real tension there. Um, and I think that is just reflective of the fact that we are becoming more corporate as a society. You know, the, the things that, um, you know, <laughs> Corporations have a lot of sway. A lot of people work for corporations. A lot of people get benefits through corporations, um, and I think I think that I think that is that is presenting in in the space of, of stadiums. But I think it's something to be really that that owners, if they were smart, need to be really mindful of and thoughtful about because not every dollar earned is necessarily a good dollar. If ultimately, 10, 20 years from now, you haven't built a new fan base because there is no that there isn't that emotional and community connection. Sorry, I guess to follow up yeah. with that, um, if, if that's the case, do you think it's like a bubble effect where eventually that pops and either stadiums have to downgrade to what you would say like want or a more you know, bare bones? Well, they are downsizing. Okay. Um, you know, there, there are, I think there are, they're already bumping up against one edge of that tension in the sense that they hadn't been able to fill up. In Colorado at, um, at Coors Field, at Progressive Field, at Ames Play, at, uh, I don't know what the heck the Miami Dolphins Stadium is called anymore. It changes every two years. Uh, Joe Robbie Stadium, Sharp, Sun Tro I don't know. State. What? Marlins State. The, where the Dolphins play. Uh, uh, it's Hard Rock Cafe. Is it Hard Rock Cafe now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they just did a renovation where they shrunk their capacity. And I think that's what we're seeing. You're seeing a trend toward, you know, fewer, higher revenue, you know, seats and spaces that you can make more off each head, more than a dollar. Uh, but you're not trying to get as many people because not as many people want to come. More people feel pressed out, priced out. More people, people aren't feeling the connection and the desire to be there. So I think we're already seeing that. And of course, you know, the fact that we have. 60 inch high def TVs is not healthy, but like that's all, that's just one, that's one of the pieces. Yeah. Sounds like down the road, you know, as corporations continue to receive for cash, but the, there's no interest in the people, you know, the corporations are going to see that and then backfire. It right? might, right? You, you hope. It, I guess it depends how many people are allowed to keep using their expense accounts at stadiums, how many people are allowed to write off suites. You know, for you know, having a business meeting and bringing a client. I mean, that too. That's part of the corporate effect. Is is it's not just the fact that like you're trying to sell me something every you know every three steps, but also who's there and why they're there. Are you there to watch the game? Or are you there to like sell a timeshare? Um, that's gonna that's gonna change that changes the complexion of experience. Yeah. I, I have a question. And that is with relationship to the player salary. Isn't that 
writing up ticket prices, which is then reducing some of the $20 tickets? Well, I don't know if it's driving up the tickets because usually the, the salaries are, you know, are usually, I mean, I mean, some of it is, is speculative in terms of what they think, right? You know, revenues and salary caps will be, they, you know, they do projections. But a lot of it has been as a result of, like, like they make more money because there's already more money coming in. Um, so I don't know that it's, I don't know that, I don't know much that that means we're responsible for it. It's, well, it's TV, I'm assuming right? that. It's, it, I'm it, assuming it, it, now it is TV. Now it is the region, right, right, baseball right. to regional cable networks for, for NFL, you know. And also, by the way, you know, these, the cable companies screwed up. Yeah. The, the last round of television negotiations, they overpaid by a lot. Right. And so we're, we're, in that sense, we're in a little bit of a bubble right now in terms of that money coming in. Because it's going to end up being things like, who knows what, OTT or streaming on Twitter and Amazon. And maybe they'll pay it just as much. There might be a bubble next time around because those folks might overpay just to get in the game uh, and they have the money to do so. Uh, but it is more it is more the, the TVs and that kind of thing, I, which I don't think, I'm not sure. So the, why, the question then yeah. is, why are they getting a hundred? Because I'm, I'm thinking right. about, I'm no, thinking you're about right. Jerry's world, right? yeah. and they paid a billion dollars for yeah. that stadium. And the next stadium that's going to be built is going to be two billion dollars. Yep. Yep. And somebody has to pay for that. Yeah. So who's paying for that? Well, right. Well, the PSL right comes. Well, that comes from the, that 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 qualifies it also as the team contribution. Yeah. The PSLs and then right, it does come from the fan. Part of that's also knowing your market, right? I mean, in Dallas, a big reason they did that is because they, you know, they did this. You know, they did the studies ahead of time, and they knew that they were going to get X number of corporate, you know, corporate season tickets. Who were going to 150k was going to be a write-off anyway, and that's that was part of the math. I mean, they knew what kind of space they were going to get. If that makes sense. I mean, they like you would never I, get a hundred. I, I get that. No, I know. For Dallas, yeah, L.A., right, New York, Chicago, right. You won't get that. Memphis Grizzlies. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not getting that. No. No, you're not, you're not getting that in Green Bay, you're not getting that. No, in Kansas City, City, Cincinnati. And that's actually one of the, that's actually a great point because that's one of the things that um, economist named Roger Knoll was really, was really trying to underscore to me was the danger of a space like AT&T Stadium based on the precedent it sets because you might take that and think you can duplicate it somewhere else without thinking about market conditions without thinking about things like this is a, a right to work state where you're not paying union wages. You know, what that like steel costs might not be, the, you know, are not gonna be the same in Dallas as they are in New York. So a billion dollars in New York doesn't buy you what it buys you in Dallas. And also, right, and also knowing what your fan, what your fan has stomach and, or wallet for. Um, so that's a really, so that's actually a really good point in the sense that, that if people do start to think that, you know, if their eyes get bigger than their stomach and thinking that they can have those kinds of stadiums just any old where we're gonna have the next round of of disasters of white elephants like this in like the Bengals stadium which you know they've been closing hospitals as a result because they were so overly optimistic in their projections this was the round of this was the round of stadiums when they said it's gonna pay for itself and it's gonna rain money um, that suddenly when those those tax those taxes you know those estimated you know you know, uh, increase in taxes weren't coming in. It's like, well, crap, we've budgeted incorrectly. Uh, so, yeah, so from that from that sense, that's like that's such a good and dangerous point. So, what's your favorite stadium, and does it is it uh, differentiate by sport or mm -hmm. professional um, in college or? Great question. Uh, it differentiates for me not just necessarily by sport, but almost by category. Like AT and T Stadium is awesome <laughs> for all the as much as I'm just shitting on it, uh, and it deserves to be shit on. It's also so over the top, and they did it so well, and they did it with such an eye for detail that like if you're gonna have one stadium that like you know ruins America, it might as well be that stadium because because it is they really do. They make sure that everything there is perfect. They make sure that every minute that you're in or around the stadium, you're just like gawking. Like there are fireworks. They have a blimp that goes around inside the stadium, you know, before the games go up. Um, so from a purely sort of like entertainment and gimmick perspective, it's AT&T Stadium. 
in terms of my my fav my just like favorite place I walk into and I feel like a change, like I feel like I'm in a special place, it's Fenway. It's Fenway Park. Uh, <laughs> and, and I say that as a Yankee fan. Well, I say it as a Yankee fan. I think that there's actually more Yankee history in Fenway Park than there is in Yankee Stadium. And part of that is just like, the longer you let a place live, the more it'll sponge. And Fenway Park has been allowed to sponge so much. Um, and frankly, they've done a terrific job in terms of the renovation, thinking about things like history and modernity. You know, you know paying attention again to those details. Uh, at Fenway Park, they, they've gone through a major renovation in the last 20 years, but they put in like top of the line, state of the art LED boards, but they're static. They don't play videos on them, but they, they put them in there to like show the player stats and whatever. And they even mimic like the, the aesthetic of the green monster with like fake rusted, you know, nuts and bolts that show there. Even the color palette, they have an old, they have an old Fenway style guide that they stick by. And they have only certain colors that they use, Fenway green, a royal blue, and a certain type of red. They have certain fonts that they use, and they all hark back to, to Red Sox history. Even, even a detail like the, um, the monster seats, which if you ever get a chance to sit up there, do it. It's cool. Uh, they, there, was a, there was a net that existed above the monster before that would catch the home run balls or the ones that weren't hit above the net uh, to keep them from you know, smashing into the car windows or going onto the highway. They created the monster seats at exactly the same height as that net was before. Could they have, if they made it 20, 20 rows higher, could they have filled them? Yes, but it would have looked weird. Like, and you, imperceptibly, unconsciously, you would have noticed that. I'm like, well, it looked different. But now it just, it looks like it's always been there. And that's my problem with Wrigley Field with those video boards that they put in with the new signs, is it, it looks like an intrusion. Fenway was really careful with how they, how they updated it. They tried to avoid the intrusions. So that's my favorite from that perspective. And if I was gonna give you a third one, it's gotta be Lambo also. And that part of that is just the character of the fan base there. As you probably know, the Packers are community owned and it's a town of 100,000 people that has an NFL franchise, which is crazy. Uh, it's only because they're community owned. And if you go there on a game day, you can kind of feel that disbelief. They're like, can you believe this? <laughs> like, we have a team. And like they just, you know, and they, they like they live that every week. It's like so fun and and and, and whimsical. At least before the game, once they start losing, things get getting get a little dark as they can at any stadium. Um, but yeah, those are. If you're only going to go to three stadiums, those are the three. So we we've, we've reached three o'clock. Anyone has more questions or wants to talk to Robbie after, um, we can do that. But thank you very much.